Hello, and thank you all for being here with us this evening. I'm so glad you could all make it. My name is Leif Cantrell, and I am Oblong's events manager, and I will be your tech host this evening. I'm so excited for this event. For our, thank you all for coming to our Oblong online event for When Birds Are Near, Dispatches from Contemporary Writers. This is an amazing nonfiction collection of writing about writing and birds and natures and so many great topics that are intermingled. So before we get begin into the meat of everything, thank you, Susan. Um, I just wanna let you all know that there will be an audience Q&A at the end of this event. So if at any point during the event, if you have a question, I ask that you put it in the ask a question box, which is down in the center of your screen. If you put them in the chat, that's gonna kind of get lost. So I'd really recommend putting it there. So that's all for housekeeping. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce my former professor, um, editor Susan Fox Rogers, who is a visiting associate professor of writing at Bard College and the author of My Reach, as well as the editor of 10 previous anthologies. Joining Susan tonight are two book contributors from When Birds Are Near, Katie Fallon, who is the author of two nonfiction books, as well as the co-author of two children's books and the fa one of the founders of the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia, which is a nonprofit dedicated to conserving wild birds. Also joining us this evening is Eli Knapp, who is an associate professor of intercultural studies, biology and earth science at Houghton College and the author of numerous publications and the author of Delightful Horror of Family Birding. I'll pass it over to you now, Susan. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you, Leif. Um, so I'm actually uh, in not in the Hudson Valley where I belong, just up the road from Oblong Books, which is my favorite independent bookstore. So um, I, I feel like, you know, all the rock stars would begin their tours in Woodstock. I begin my tours, my book tours in Oblong Books and Rhinebeck. OK, <laughs> and uh, but I happen to be in Dallas, which is. The, I, I just decided to go on a road trip uh, to see the world and to see some birds. And so in this COVID time, the fact that things are virtual is actually a, a great freedom. And the fact that we have these two people, one from West Virginia and the other one from Northern New York state here, um, this wouldn't be possible without the internet. So I think this is um, as much as I find the COVID time challenging, there's, there's a few silver linings to it, which is to be able to meet these two people who I've never met before. And it's, this is um, a real treat. So um, one of the advantages of editing an anthology, especially one where I don't have any of my own writing in the collection, is that I can just be flat out proud of this book. Um, it is, uh, it, it's just an amazing collection and um, I, I, uh, I do not have to be in any way modest about it. So like when writers do their readings, they have to at least pretend, you know, have some humbleness as they read their work and their friends show up at their readings. And like as the editor, I can just be like, the writing here is spectacular. And um, what I really love about this collection is that uh, it has such a range of writers in it. It has, um, for instance, uh, one of my former students who graduated just a few years ago, Christina Ball, and another very young writer who's recently out of college, Alison Vilag. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her last name correctly. I've never met her. And then we have the you know nationally famous writers such as Jonathan Franzen. So it, there's such a range of voices here, and they all come together. And um, so that aspect of it pleases me. The fact that they did a an incredibly beautiful cover. I mean, isn't that adorable? So they did a great cover. I'm happy about that. Um, and so when we did this event, I, I chose these two writers um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, I feel that they have certain things in common. They both uh, have children whom they are bringing up to love the natural the world and to identify birds and uh, know their birds. And um, both are teachers, both have taught um, taking uh, students into the field. Eli actually uh, takes students off to the Serengeti, am I correct? Every every year, yep. um, which seems uh, it's especially intrepid. And the piece that he'll read from is about taking students to Arizona, which is where I'm headed. Um, and Katie has also worked, you know, having students go into the field as well. So that sort of belief in experience added to, to reading, reading is in, in part, um, uh, why I've edited this collection. I started birding 10 years ago and I, I, um, uh, I don't really understand anything until I read about it. And so I started reading an enormous amount um, 
uh, a range of writers, early writers, um, even going back to Alexander Wilson, um, but then sort of moving forward to like Florence Miriam Bailey, and then a lot of contemporary writers. And these are two people whose work I uh, deeply admired and enjoyed. I read Katie's um, Cerulean Blues and was just kind of, um, it was it was both a, 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 a journey of learning and an emotional journey. And I just thought it was marvelous. And then I read Eli's book, um, The Delightful Horror of Family Birding. And as you can tell from the title, it's a very funny book, which in the bird world is not that common actually. Um, we, we tend toward uh, a, a sort of a piousness, I would say. So the, the humor there I thought was was just um, wonderful. So I wrote to both of them and said, hey, I, I want to I want to edit this book. And, and and as Leif mentioned, it's sort of uh, this is not the first book that I've edited. I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm an editor. I, I like working with words of other people, whether that's teaching writing or whether it's um, actually putting together a book. And the way I've always um, edited books is to sort of think about um, what, what do I want to read? And so this, this is exactly the book I want to read. And, and of course, then when you're the editor, you get to read it about 10 times, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, which maybe is a little overkill, but um, I, I, it's, it's, it's a great experience to edit a book. And so I've always edited books that I wanted to read. Um, so bringing together these, these two writers here tonight who are also within this collection, the, 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 their connections of, of what they're going to, of, of what they wrote about and how they write. Um, and we were talking a little bit beforehand um, a, a, about sort of, uh, Eli's just finished a piece where, do you want to describe your piece? It's COVID. Oh, right. Yeah, it's 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 a part of a, a blog about the pandemic and about writing and about nature all all wrapped it together. Yeah. So so I feel like all of us, uh, you know, the writing that I've done um, is also I, I sort of, you know, throw it all together. It's a little bit of my life and it's a little bit of, you know, na natural history. And I think all of us bring in a scientific perspective to a certain extent. And and so that sort of, you know, to me, that's a classic personal essay um, here. I'm going to be the, you know, put on my teacher hat. And, and uh, you know, this goes back to Montaigne, which begins in the personal. He sort of wanders out and it's very meandering essays. I think Thoreau being his, his, his essay walking sort of being the, the quintessential let's meander along and sort of think about these things. So I think both of you uh, in your work, whether in the essays in this collection or your larger work, have this amazing ability to sort of put it together. And it's like, that's life, you know, you don't just go birding, you have a family and you're thinking about the environment and politics are happening around and, and that all comes into play to what you see and how you see it and how you understand it. And I just, I love that about both of your work. So, um, so I've, talked a little bit about enough, I think. Um, and uh, so I thought maybe the way we would begin is the way the book begins, which is uh, with Katie's essay. Um, it's a it's a beautiful, shorter piece. Uh, the, 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 the collection goes from Katie's essay, which is three pages long to um, Jonathan Franzen, which just is incredibly long <laughs> at the end. It's like, it's almost like the, the anthology expands outward, right? So Katie's going to read um, the whole essay and then we can, I'm, we're going to have a little conversation between the three of us and then Eli will read. So you can have a sense of what's going to happen. Okay, go ahead, Katie. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Susan. Um, and thank you, Eli. Uh, it's great to be here uh, with everybody. Um, and thank you everybody out there um, watching yeah. and listening. Uh, I'm very excited to, <laughs> um, I'm really excited that Susan um, asked me to be part of this. Uh, and I love this book. Uh, and I think it would be, you know, it would be a great, great holiday gift. <laughs> um, everybody knows a birder who needs a book, right? It's <laughs> I know, and it's great. And it, it's great. It's, there are great literary essays in here. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a, a really great read. Um, so the piece that I'm going to read is short, and I, I should mention that it was written um, originally as part of Shavers Creek Environmental Center's uh, Writer in Residence program. So Shavers Creek Environmental Center, I know Susan knows it, uh, it's a wonderful place at um, Penn State University, owned by Penn State University. Uh, you know, a, half an hour or so from state college and it's uh, a really <laughs> yes <laughs> and uh and I, I went to penn state 
too. And I was, I was very excited to um, <laughs> come back to Shavers Creek and participate in this writer in residence program where sort of my task was to write eight short pieces about um, different sites throughout Shavers Creek. So this Great. is a short essay. Um, it's called Nighthawks, Lake Perez. Lake Perez is a, a small um, human-made lake um, in Shavers Creek. And there are little cabins that are right along at that. You can all, you can all rent um, if you go there. And it's a, it's a really beautiful place to, to visit and to hike around. So um, this essay is about uh, Lake, per about night, well, it's about, about all kinds of things, right? But it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's what watching Nighthawks um, over this lake. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. The sounds of a party, a wedding, float across Lake Perez in Stone Valley. Bursts of laughter, children calling to each other, and the low bubbling murmur of conversation. I don't know who's gotten married or where they're from, but love is in the air. And this is my favorite time of year, mid-May, appropriate for weddings, for renewal, for rushing into bloom. I sit on the opposite bank, just down the hill from the cabin where I'll be spending the night. Before me, nighthawks wheel and boomerang above the lake's glassy black surface, their long wings cutting the air. The birds' movements are fluid, elastic, easy, and graceful. They swoop low, then climb, swoop low again like giant agile bats hawking insects. Each long wing bears a distinct white stripe, which looks like a strip of reflective tape from below. Mm -hmm. And each bird's white throat patch gleams against the darkening sky. Perhaps the nighthawks are fueling up before the storm we all know will come tomorrow, the rain so common in an Appalachian spring. Perhaps they're pushing on ahead of it, migrating still, making their way north from their South American wintering grounds. I want to call across the lake to the folks at the wedding to get them to look at the bird show overhead. Instead, I watch in wide-eyed silence. Nighthawks and their relatives, whippoorwills, oil birds, frog mouths, oh no, parakeets, <laughs> <and everything, laughs> and night jars are odd, secretive, mostly crepuscular or nocturnal birds. On the wing, a common nighthawk is acrobatic and incredibly sleek. In the hand, however, its wings seem too long, its body squat and strange, its eyes dark and clear as a mountain lake at dusk. A nighthawk's tiny black beak hides an enormous mouth that resembles a bullfrog's when it opens. Because they eat and drink while flying, this oversized mouth is useful for trapping insects and skimming lake water. The ancient Greeks and Romans believed that these unusual birds used their huge mouths for another purpose, drinking milk from the teats of goats and sheep under the cover of night. According to the lore, a goat suckled by a night jar met an unfortunate end, blindness and then death. Of course, the birds do not engage in this behavior, but the belief earned their, fam earned their family the name Caprimulgidae, or goat sucker. As Stone Valley darkens, I retreat to my cabin and recline on the bench outside the door. Birds around me sing to the fading day. An eastern wood peewee, the first I've heard this spring, a wood thrush a ch and chipping sparrows below the pines. Frogs along the lake shore join the chorus, but my mind is still soaring with the nighthawks. My first encounter with the nighthawk had been more than 15 years earlier. I just started graduate school and had moved to West Virginia with my boyfriend, now my husband, Jesse. He dreamt of going to veterinary school one day, so two evenings a week he volunteered at a local small animal clinic. We also began volunteering together at a wildlife rehabilitation center, and injured birds of all sorts began to find their way to us. Still do. <laughs> Chew boxes and dog carriers would appear at the clinic, containing limping geese, twisted ducklings, cat attacked robins, and one evening a small bundle of brown and black feathers with long wings, a mini beak, and glossy black eyes. Someone had found the strange bird stunned on the shoulder of a road and scooped it into a box. Radiographs showed a wing fracture, but it wasn't badly displaced. We wrapped the wing to the bird's body and would wait for it to heal. We soon realized that caring for an immobile nighthawk would be difficult. Three or four times a day, I cupped the bird in my hands while Jesse gently pried open its beak and pushed a cricket or mealworm or soggy piece of cat kibble inside. It was labor intensive and stressful for the bird and us, but we all soldiered on. I remember how warm the bird was, how its feathers were impeccable. Jesse and I worried it would lose too much weight 
and that or that our insect and cat kibble regime wasn't appropriate. We kept the box clean and warm, lined with soft cloth. We cooed over the bird. We stared into its black eyes. Of course, we fell in love with the nighthawk and with each other. Weeks passed. Finally, the bone was stable, calloused, and it was time for the bird to exercise. But how? The wildlife center didn't have a flight cage with small enough mesh, and the veterinary clinic didn't have a spare room. Our apartment was too crowded with animals already, so we improvised. Behind the animal hospital was a wet, swampy meadow filled with high grass and cattails. At dusk, Jesse and I would head out there, stand facing each other, and slowly, gently toss the nighthawk back and forth. <laughs> Every evening we stood further and further apart and the bird's strength returned. The last few evenings it wheeled over our heads and we turned and sprinted after, following the bird to the place it finally landed. Then one evening it happened. I gently tossed the nighthawk and the bird beat its long wings and lifted, lifted, lifted into the darkening sky much higher than it had flown before. Jesse ran, but it was futile. The nighthawk kept going higher and farther until it was out of sight. We cheered and cried, hugged and collapsed, laughing in the meadow. From my bench outside my cabin in Stone Valley, I smile at the memory and look out over Lake Perez. Fish lip the water, leaving concentric rings on the surface. The robins, settling in the pines, sing abbreviated songs. The wedding's voices and laughter continue to float across the lake, though muted now, softening. Nighthawks still dance in the twilight, their reflections flickering on the, on the dark water. I will never know for sure if our Nighthawk's repaired wing was strong enough to fly to South America and back, season after season. Perhaps the bird ended up on a road again, or succumbed to any one of a number of dangers during migration. Perhaps, ultimately, the life of one Nighthawk is insignificant. Perhaps our human lives are insignificant, too. But no matter how small, on that day's end, as the sun slipped below the horizon, what returned to the sky was made of love, was buoyed by love. The same love spins in the air tonight and fills the valley. Long may it fly. That's great. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, it's so wonderful to have this sort of affirmative, love-filled, hope-filled essay <laughs> in these times <laughs> where we've taken a Thanks. turn in this direction. So that was wonderful, Katie. Thank you. Um, Thank so you. I, know, I know Eli said that he had questions. So if we can all, you know, jump in, uh, I think that probably for the bird people in the, um, in the audience, uh, the idea of playing toss with a night hawk might be <laughs> one of the most glorious things to imagine. <laughs> well, it's probably not the recommended rehabilitation practice. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, I still um, rehabilitate wild birds, and I have never played toss with a nighthawk again. No, uh -huh. it was a one, it was a one shot deal. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, what, what, what? I mean, I'm, I'm curious. What is the recommended way to get a bird to fly again? Then, I mean, um, uh, there. It depends on the species, but for a bird like a bird like a nighthawk, I mean, we have a. We now use big, uh, sort of like tents, tents with them. Um, like that like mosquito like you would have a picnic under yeah um so when we're trying to when we're when we're exercising songbirds um we we put them in tents like this to try to you know and so we handle them as little as possible <laughs> uh-huh i see so they're they're sort of left on their own yeah yeah if we can yeah mm -hmm. but the, it's very hard birds that eat on the wing though are uh that feed on the wing are in, in my experience really difficult to rehab you know, uh -huh. chimney swifts, swallows, uh, nighthawks. Uh -huh. So working closely with birds like that, you know, I've, it's not something that I've done. I, you know, I've gone to a couple bird banding. But to, how does that affect your your writing about the birds or your understanding of them? I mean, there's an intimacy there in, in holding a bird that you don't have if you're just looking at them through binoculars, right? Sure. Well, one of the things that's most striking to me, I think, is every bird is an individual. Um you know, every single individual bird is different. Uh -huh. uh, you know, even birds of the same species. Well, that's I mean, if we have, um, you know, if we have a, if we have a, a cage of, you know, we get a lot of fledgling robins in. If we have four robins in a cage. You can look at them and you know which robin is which. Well, yeah, um, that's great. Yeah. Uh, because they're not all. They don't all. You know, they're they have individual. Oh, that's the. And you know, we often think working with assigned human you know, labels to them, like that's the pushy Robin, you know, right. uh -huh. um, 
that's that's the robin that you know does uh -huh. this or you know that's uh -huh. that's the robin that beats up the other ones or whatever you know there's uh -huh. but they become they're an, an individual an individual so uh -huh. it seems like once at least for me once i know that once i learned that each of these little birds that i would see it you know is that's an individual right. with its own quirks and its own you know own birdality or personality it's right, uh, right. it makes looking at them sort of different Right. Well, you have this beautiful line in your essay right toward the end. And I love how it takes that turn from the experience of the bird and the, the rehabilitation. And then, you know, at the very end, you do this marvelous thing of sort of thinking about, um, you know, perhaps ultimately the life of one night hawk is insignificant, insignificant. Perhaps our human lives are insignificant, too. And, and obviously in that sort of sense of insignificant is like, of course it's not, you know, e each one of these <laughs> matters, right? So that to be able to write a sentence like that from your intimacy with the birds of, of really seeing them as individuals as opposed to lumping them together as, as species, right? Which I think a lot of bird watchers, we, you know, I, I, you know, it's sort of making me think about that differently too. It's like all, every song sparrow is an individual song sparrow, right? It's, it's great. Okay. Great, well, thank you. <laughs> You, yeah, you, like, it's you a, want to jump in with a question since I'm sort of, you know. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I didn't have questions as much as just comments. I, I also like how someone in the chat has picked up on Birdality, which I think I think Katie needs to be the, the title of your next book. It's going to be. Actually. That, <laughs> yeah. that, that's my friend Donna, who's a poet. So that, that explains that. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely fabulous. I, yeah, I, I think um, I'm a little... Well, I guess I'm not jealous. For some reason, um, we get associated with birds. Obviously, people pick up on our passion um, over time, especially if we are in a community for any kind of duration. And it sounds like people bring you the birds that have a chance. And for some reason, people only bring me the birds that are deceased. And so I get <laughs> new specimens of all of these birds that I could be hauled off to jail for. And I have no idea what I'm supposed to, how I'm supposed to, I can't say <laughs> no because I've love all these people that are just yesterday i was handed a beautiful screech owl um you know mm -hmm. that had hit the, car, the grill of a car and the, and you know what do i do with this thing so i'm usually you know down in my basement madly trying to draw it or something give it some kind of um uh, uh i guess honor before i find of a way to you know dispose of it or or whatnot. So I'm a, so I'm you a know, freezer full of birds. I think more highly of you, I guess. Um, I have I have three fear three freezers full of dead birds. <laughs> <laughs> like a chest free. A ch I it's, it really do. It's um kind of shot. It's kind of it's kind of horrifying. Yeah. Well, I, guess, I think also I'm also amazed, really I'm amazed that in two pages you managed to write something that's about hope i mean to me it's a pian it's one of those songs of praise and triumph like you you put it's about hope it's about um you know what can we do with what we have it's about facing long odds and and not giving up um about being bold about living with the results uh somehow I, i've kind of committed myself to rereading your piece uh whenever i'm feeling like i just need a shot of <laughs> you got to keep going regardless of what we know and what we don't know um we give it our best and and we and we leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it's um, and that keep keep them going. I mean, feed, I remember feeding that nighthawk is it's feeding any um, again yeah. anything that eats insects on the wing. It's like you basically have to almost grab them and feed them. And it's like a, I I, I raised um, fourteen chimney swifts this this past summer, um. And uh, I mean, they ate, you know, babies, baby chimney swifts that would fall into people's fireplaces. Um, and luckily, I have this really weird house that has like, or luckily or not luckily, I have a strange house that has kind of an inside, the chimney is kind of inside the porch uh, or the brick of the chimney. So I could put all these chimney swifts on my, on my porch, on my chimney. Um, and he'd open the door and they'd all go hanging from the chimney, yelling at me. You know, and you have to go around to each of them and feed them. You know, we fed them, you know, slurry and bugs and. Uh, That's great. Every like every you know every forty five minutes. Um, and you have birds that stick around then after being hand raised that that actually don't want to leave or or they all head out. Uh, most of them all go. Mm -hmm. Most of them leave. Um, but when we when we do a 
the chimney swifts all definitely go. We release them. They crawl up a chimney, and there we have a lot of chimney swifts in the town where I live, and they join the, uh, the wild chimney. The wild chimney swifts. It's really beautiful. They kind of come down a little bit when they hear the chittering, and then the young ones fly and go off with them, and wow. supposedly they follow them to the roost and then are gone. That's it. Um, yeah. mm. But whenever we do robins, or we do a lot of robins, and we have a, a tent where we do a soft release where we continue to feed the, you know, after the tent's been opened and the birds leave, we continue to leave them food. So uh, there tend to be a lot of robins in that area. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's marvelous. <laughs> your, your piece really made me think of this one line from an essay a little bit later in the book called Little Brown Birds by Richard Bohannon. Um, I loved it, but he, he writes in, in that essay, the plains of North Dakota are a little brown bird ignored and declining, but still singing for those who listen. And yeah. I could just picture myself on the on the side of Lake Perez, um, yeah. just so, so vividly in, in your prose there that, um, yeah, I just, I wanted I wanted to be there. I wanted to be seeing that those, you know, the, the wings of those night hawks cut through the air. So it was, it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So Eli, I'm gonna to turn to you and, and I'm gonna begin by asking you about this epigraph that you have to your wonderful essay titled, One Single Hummingbird, right? Science and everyday life cannot and should not be separated. You wrote that before the Trump administration or during? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Sorry. Yeah, no, no help, but gloat a little bit here, okay? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um... I, I'm an academic, so kind of steeped in, I guess when I, born with a love of nature, um, and I think we all, well, I mean, I guess I hope we all have kind of points of attachment. I've often wondered why I am the way I am. And I think one of the earliest memories I have that um, kind of explains the interest I have in the natural world is I was down on, on my dock and I was fishing and I, cast out into a lake and I caught this little tiny fish. And I was like, oh, shucks, you know? And so I took it off and rebated the hook, go found, found another worm, put it on and I cast out again. And I got a bite and it was another little fish. And I was like, oh gosh. So I took it off and I found another worm and then I did it again and I got a third little fish. And, and, um, and I was frustrated by this point, you know, my 11 year old self. And, and so instead of picking that little fish off, I cast it out. But instead of the going way out over the water, the line went straight up because it was a little heavier because it had a fish on it. And it hit over a branch and it came down and it swung next to the shore, not far from where I was standing on the dock. And now it's like, oh, I've got a, I'm in a pickle now. And as it, it hung there for all of about three seconds when this all of a sudden this thing shot out from the shore and grabbed the fish. And I realized it was a snake that had grabbed, grabbed the fish. And I'm just standing there just with my, you know, my jaw on the, on the dock. Um, just like, wow, I'm what, this is spectacular. I'm in a nature documentary. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. So I just started reeling and, and sure enough, the snake was locked on and, and I reeled this snake way up into a tree and it was just swinging there totally vertically above the water. Uh, it's, it's like little anecdotes like that when I, when I've just been absolutely flabbergasted by the natural world that I think I found this like point of attachment. And what I've, what I've really tried to do, what I try to do in my students is try to give them a point of attachment as well. And so I sort of look at birds as like a gateway drug uh, mm -hmm. into the natural world. And, I, and it seems like a lot of the fellow writers in, in this oh, yeah. do that. Yeah. Um, it's whatever that kind of point of attachment is. So yeah, I, I was writing technical papers in grad school. I was working on a dissertation and realizing that every day that I did that, uh, was kind of sucking the life. It was enervating, sucking the life out of me. So I would say, if, Eli, if you can focus for an hour uh, and write this technical paper, you can then, you can reward yourself by uh, a fun pleasure book over here. So I started reading just natural history books by, you know, whomever. And I would look forward so much to getting that done so I could read, you know, and be inspired again. So one kind of, not that academic writing is bad, it's necessary and good and, and all that, but one was life kind of sucking and draining and the other one was life giving. <laughs> and so I've tried to, I think why I write um, is, is just to kind of infuse myself uh -huh. with life. Yeah. That's a big preamble. Um, that's, a great, that's a great preamble to what's gonna come here though. That's perfect. <laughs> okay. uh, so 
Um, Susan was gracious enough not to mention to our audience out there that um, she actually gave me two tries at this. My my first essay um, wasn't quite what she was looking for, so she so thank you, Susan. I, you know, I have I actually have no memory of that. That's I only remember the good Eli. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Would you like me to go ahead and read? Yes, please do. Yep. Why I wondered had I opted for two low clearance minivans for cheese grater roads like this? Sure, the keyless entry and automatic doors were nice, as was the discounted price. But the manufacturers at Chrysler obviously hadn't been considering accessibility to Lucifer hummingbird haunts when designing these. My current predicament could not be pinned on short-sighted auto manufacturers, however. I was the one who had led us here. For three weeks, we'd studied birds in Western New York. Then, to better appreciate bird diversity across the U.S., I brought my 12 college students here to Texas for the culminating week of my intensive ornithology course. It was a trip to gain perspective, make some memories, and chase a few Southwestern specialties. The most special of all I preached in the days leading up to the trip was a dainty hummingbird sporting a slightly decurved bill a forked tail, and a shimmery purple throat, a feature I ceaselessly reminded my students was better called a, a gorget in ornithology circles. We'd spent the previous six days watching greater roadrunners, phanopeplas, and elf owls. The little Lucifer, several of which would, could be comfortably tucked into a shirt pocket, was our final quest. The dusty pothole road, more resembling a cattle trail, bumped my thoughts around. Bird love flowed in my veins. I wanted to behold each and every species. Now as a professor, I wanted my students to do the same. But why was I so focused on this one particular species? Sure, Lucifer hummingbirds were pretty, but with the exception of the Chihuahuan raven, so were all the birds we'd seen so far. In field guides, Lucifer hummingbirds didn't seem too different from the dozens of ruby-throated hummingbirds we'd seen in the east, nor were its proclivities different. Like the other 24 hummingbirds that spend time in the US, the Lucifer specialized in drinking nectar. More noteworthy was its name. Lucifer means light bearing in Latin, likely a reference to its iridescent gorget. That, and according to one dubious source I really want to believe, a group of Lucifers is called an inferno. Dri <laughs> Driving me deep down wasn't behavior, appearance, or funky nomenclature. It was rarity. Only 10%, the intrepid few, entered the U.S. each summer, sporadically appearing in New Mexico, West Texas, and little slivers of Arizona. Most stayed in the stronghold, Mexico. Yes, rarity alone, that fickle and somewhat arbitrary characteristic shared by snow leopards and Tanzanite had pulled my car load and the second minivan of students I could now no longer see in the dust cloud to this specific spot. Okay, so Eli's, Eli's ending here. This is obviously not the end of his essay, right? This is a cliffhanger. It's like, what's going to happen? Um, and I thought we would just stop, pause for a moment and, and talk about this. Um, the two things that sort of come up in this, in my mind, is sort of um, the, the the idea of the rarity, right, and and the, the crazy stuff that will make some of us do, um, but also this idea that um, you know taking a bunch of students down a dirt road to the middle of nowhere <laughs> is a good idea. I, I would agree with it, but I'm not sure that everybody would, and so sort of. Uh, to me, the you know the adventure of, of birding, uh, which very much of the time is an adventure uh, for me, um, it it does involve sort of a, a little bit of misery, right? Um, and uh, and and dragging your students along is maybe not the way to sort of you know get get them to love birds. Um, so if you can talk a little bit about sort of these these things that sort of come together, and it's often those rare birds that demand that you you know almost almost freeze to death or, or almost die of sunstroke or, you know, get lost on a trail or whatever just for that bird, right? Yeah, we, we birders are a weird lot. I mean, that, that's, that's for sure. I think, Susan, ultimately this book was your gift to all of us because it finally <laughs> allowed, I think, all of us to like find our tribe. We're all sort of scattered around and this allowed us, when I was reading Christina Bales, for, for instance, I realized- She's my former student. <laughs> I said to myself, "Well, I'm really tame. Like, I'm, I'm nothing compared to She'll these. Love that. I haven't done anything yet. So, yeah, I kind of got re-inspired to um, to get back out there. She says it really well. I mean, she says that yeah, birding is is kind of masochistic. Um, and you know, I have a one of my old <laughs> <laughs> one of my old uh, bio professors was you know infamous for saying it's not a real lab until your underwear gets wet, and uh, <laughs> and would uh, and you know pray for rain on everything and that." It's those kind of 
it's those kind of experiences um, that, you know, are hard at the moment, but in retrospect, sometimes in the very moment itself are, are absolutely, um, they stretch students and they become the stuff that bonds you all together and to the natural world. I mean, in when we were in Big Bend, Texas, for instance, it, you know, here's dry Texas for how we stereotyped it. And a freak storm blew up um, on the first night we were there in Big Bend National Park and, and tents were collapsing and I had people holding them up all night, you know, and in the morning, um, in the morning, it soaked, you know, sleepless students who didn't want to be anywhere else. Like this was a grand lark that they were out on. And our quest was almost irrelevant. Like okay. they were, they had kind of, you know, they were giving up all the trappings that, um, you know, can kind of saddle us. And, and I think we're kind of experiencing life anew mm -hmm. and, and it is stressful. There's, it's stressful, especially to be the leader. I, I don't want um, <laughs> yeah. to try to sugarcoat this at all. Uh, there's, yeah. I've second guessed myself many, many times and often wonder why I'm doing what I'm doing. But again, I think, I think it's believing in the purpose of it all. Um, realizing that there is really nothing better than um, giving giving students a real experience, some kind of authentic encounter with the natural world. Mm -hmm. And again, birds just make themselves, they avail themselves a little bit better than other species. They're a little easier to find. Um, and they have that, what you started asking me, you know, they have that rare element where it's like a grand puzzle out there. And mm -hmm. we get a lot of it completed, but you know, that those missing pieces irk us. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just me, but you you want to find that that piece that's missing. Mm, that's great. Yep, it's and, often on the floor behind the couch too. The missing puzzle piece. <laughs> and sometimes you find it when you're not looking for it. The serendipity right. moments, right? Um, right. Yeah. That that keep you going. But sometimes you know you really do have to work for it. Um, yeah. You've got to drive six hours and you know sleep under a park bench and and. I don't know, it's Ken Kaufman, ate cat food or whatever, you know, and and you have great experiences along the way. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, those adrenaline moments, I think, mix with that kind of the everyday enjoying birds that are at your feeder. Yeah. You know? And they mix into the, and they make this kind of beautiful milieu. I, I think that a lot of nature appreciators have, you know, kind of feed on. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, this, this sort of, um, you know, and I think this is sort of implicit in a beautiful way in, in Katie's piece as well as sort of this this desire for community. Right. And and what you're talking about is with, um, you know, with the with the students sort of bonding over sort of the shared misery of spending a, a wet night in a tent. Right. Um, and and that, you know, and I have, I have to say that when I edit books, I do think about it as creating a, a community of people who we all love birds and we all um engage in this sort of beautiful and crazy activity but we also need need to write about it right and that um in in bringing together in in all the anthologies that i've edited i i felt like i've I, you know maybe tribe is not the word that i've used but you know the, to think of that i've created a kind of community and um, it's one of those things that I really loved about the work that I've done editing books is sort of you know and there's there's actually a piece in the collection titled um something rather my tribe do, do, do you remember that one uh, mm -hmm. that where he's explicitly talking about sort of becoming a birder and um uh where is this, this is my tribe by thomas bancroft. by thomas bancroft right and um sort of that 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 realization that these other bird people are are his people and i think that for many that that's that's an experience of sort of you know communal language and for those of us who are interested in the history of birding and and all of it it sort of you know becomes you know a larger tribe you know but this is sort of like the book is sort of a mini tribe amongst you know the larger right? which is great you know for for me anyway it's sort of so so eli goes off on this adventure and he takes us students down the road and so he's going to read a little bit more but maybe you can provide a little bit of the the segue between you you can you can give away the you know the right so i guess what i do in this it's a it's a month-long ornithology course and for a few years i just did it in new york and then um i started realizing hey i can i can take these students far afield they're up for it and so I started just picking destinations, um, little selfishly destinations I'd like to go as well. Uh, so I dragged them to Ecuador and Costa Rica and oh my God. And, and all over the place. And, and, uh, and the students were thrilled and, and really enjoyed it. And so I, I realized I just, Arizona, you know, it's that 
it's that spot that you know Arizona and and uh, Texas that have just a whole suite of birds that we you know Easterners don't don't encounter very often. So I take students there and then because you can't do traditional really teaching in that environment, I just really, their assignment is to just embrace the experience. And they do have to, they have to record the birds they find and then they have to journal faithfully each day. Um, I try to, you know, sometimes do some monologues along the way and teach them and they have to, um, they can kind of, I, I encourage them to do a free write at the end and just sort of try to process each day what they're experiencing so that they can better digest what's going on. So then they hand me all those and then the course abruptly ends. And so they all go off to summer jobs and whatnot and I'm left with a stack. Uh, of, <laughs> and the and of, having to grade. <laughs> right, right, that's the, that's the payoff of all this. But you know, the visions of, of hummingbirds and elf owls are so great that usually I can get through it. So that's where I'll pick up. I've got this stack of journals and and then I'll, I'll, I'll read a little bit more. Continuing on, Kyle wrote on one of the last pages, we drove down a crazy dirt road to find one single hummingbird, and that was quite the experience. I reread Kyle's run-on sentence. Something about the way he phrased one single hummingbird stopped me. Technically, of course, Kyle was wrong. We'd seen at least a half dozen hummingbirds on that trip to Christmas Mountain's oasis. But I understood his sentiment. We'd risk flat tires and fragile psyches all to see one single species, a species weighing less than a nickel, and one that before the course started was unknown to my students. Although he didn't write it, the question Kyle asked was obvious. Why? Why risk so much for something so little? The more I've hung out with seasoned birders, the more I've realized they rarely ask themselves this question. Most have reconciled themselves to their passion, and besides, they already know the answer. Birds may be small and weigh little, but they're big in everything else. Abilities, beauty, and most importantly, the way they consume our imagination like few creatures can. As a biology professor in midlife, I'm content with my interests. Like I said, I was born this way. But I've struggled to articulate why I like birds and why I like to share my passion to others. A Passage in Care of the Soul, a book by Thomas More, has helped me of late. If you don't love things in particular, you cannot love the world because the world doesn't exist except in individual things. Such a great quote. Do you want to keep reading? Uh, I could read, I could maybe skip a little bit and read the very end, but I that thought would, that, that, that part would. really segued on nicely to Katie's. I, I thought Katie yeah. with those Nighthawks, that one single Nighthawk that, you know, she's playing water balloon toss with. <laughs> um, and that kind of, is it all worth it? What am I doing this for? But we're going to trust the process. Um, I thought that really... Yeah, I thought that was beautiful. So I'll just read the final. I'll skip to the final and then we'll, um, I'll let you take it away. That'd be great. With all the ecological problems facing us, habitat loss, land fragmentation, pesticide use, invasive species, the time to champion the particular seems ripe. For most of us, attachments to particular species lead us to larger, more global concerns. This is why for the days I have left to teach, I will continue carting my students to places where peregrine, fal peregrine interruptions are possible. It's why, poorly chosen minivans or not, I'll keep leading them down dusty pothole roads. I'll use the props nature provides and seize each moment, no matter how trivial. I could settle by giving each student a goldfish, but I'd rather gamble, push them outside and bring them somewhere well off the beaten path. Maybe one day they'll mutiny and demand to stay in places with Wi-Fi and phone coverage. But if they don't, the reward may be as memorable as it is dazzling a rarely seen species sporting a decurved bill, a forked tail, and a shimmery purple gorget. Hopefully an inferno, but even one will suffice, one single hummingbird. That's so great. <laughs> as, I, as I read that, um, I, I think I was writing that as much to myself. Mm. Um, you yeah. know, as, as uh, keep, keep, keep doing it, Eli. Um, yeah. lest, lest you get cold feet and, and think of reasons not to. It's a lot easier to bird alone and, and not bring a lot of students along but yeah but it's it's worth it it's definitely worth it yeah that that's it's it's just such a it's a, it's just such a wonderful ending there um and it does you know I, I often feel as if both when i'm writing when i'm and when i'm teaching that i'm sort of talking to myself <laughs> you know that, that that sort of it's almost the um the reminder um and i mean and but you know little things that you do here like hopefully an inferno taking us back to this idea of a, a group of hummingbirds. love that <laughs> is, is there any chance that's true 
I'm, I'm sure hoping. I mean, the internet is full of everything. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to believe it. You know, uh -huh. I'm going to, I'm going to believe that Katie's Nighthawk is still flying. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's keep, keep the hope alive. So, I mean, I love the pairing of sort of in very different contexts and in very different ways, both of you are thinking about sort of the importance of that one bird, right? And, or whether it's the one species or the one particular bird that you, you know, your one particular nighthawk, your one particular hummingbird. And it's just, um, it, I just find it incredibly moving as well as also kind of, it, it is funny, the idea of like bumping down this road with these students who just are thinking, what are we doing here? And Kyle's language. H have you spoken to him since writing this essay? Oh, I, I, Kyle's here. I, he's in the crowd. Oh, yeah. He's, he's on board. Say, how about a call out to Eli students? Are any of them actually in the audience? And <laughs> how much do they forgive you? You know. I, I know exactly. The power of extra credit is big. <laughs> so, Katie, is there something that you would like to comment on in terms of Eli's work? Or and then I see that we're sort of nearing the quarter of the hour where we open it up to. Um, uh, questions from uh, yeah. I'm I'm just wondering. Um, uh, you say birding alone is. You just said a, a couple a moment ago. Birding alone is a lot easier, you know, than taking the students out. Taking students out birding. Um, so is it you know is it uh, the sort of the birds are the gateway, you know, great. I think he's the gateway species. Right, I think you said before you started. So, is that really is your underlying purpose really to save the planet, um, <laughs> and that's why sort of or save us all to sh you know sharing birds, yeah. um, you know, or is it just a or is it a simpler, uh, you know, just trying to share something you love with mm. the students that you teach? It's a that's, and I've asked myself yeah. that sort of similar question like yeah. that because inevitably when you're looking at birds you are confronted with environmental issues right so mm -hmm. go ahead Eli sorry I don't mean to no. right well it's right. it's funny I um I there's yeah it, it's I'd love to say it's noble Katie and that yeah you know all of this is a you know <laughs> ploy to, to save the planet it's probably the former right it's probably I just love birds <laughs> And, you know, sharing the things we love is, you know, probably the greatest human passion or the greatest human experience. Um, mm. that, that said, I we were talking before, you know, we went live here um, and I'm madly writing up, uh, writing my second book. And and it, this one's about extinction, this, this second book. And I, I don't know if there's a more dreadful topic to write about than than extinction. It's one of those heavy, awful, gloomy, ominous words and so I've been trying to figure out a way, how can I write about extinction with humor and hope? And um, and not, you know, just play the chicken little uh, role. And, and so I think it's Michael Pollan, um, you know, well-known author, Michael Pollan, who said, you know, it's it's somebody's second book. It's a sec an author's second book is really important because that's the one that kind of determines the trajectory. And, so as I was toying with various ideas of, of the second book I wanted to write, I, I realized that I, I, extinction matters to me. Like it, it really matters to me. I look at the delightful horror of family birding as sort of that, that first step in of like deepening wonder. Cause the subtitle is sharing nature with, with the next generation. It's, it's raising my kids up in this world of nature appreciation, you know, trying to infuse my students with that, with that nature appreciation. But but after that, what's the next step? And I'm trying to take that next step in, in my next book that's called Dead Serious, Living Am Amid the Sixth Extinction, is what do we do um, once we, for all of us wonder-filled people, um, what do we do? What are the next steps we take? And this isn't a how-to, it's probably a lot more of a, a, of a sequel of, you know, kind of wonderful look at our planet. But I really feel that the way forward um, is celebrating it. To be honest, it's it's yeah. that's it, um, and that's what I'm trying to do. It's it's realizing um, how great the things that are left are, yeah. And how do we celebrate it? It, it seems like all the other ways, the statistics of doom and gloom. Uh, we've done that. We've been there and done that. And um, so I, I feel I feel your charge. I feel your question. I, I'm 
I'm wrestling with it. I'll probably wrestle with it all the way till I fertilize, you know, the fields myself. <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah. So why don't we open up the, 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 the field to other questions from the audience if there are any, and otherwise we'll just keep talking to each other. <laughs> Thank you all. This has been such an engaging conversation. I didn't even want to come back on screen because I didn't want to interrupt. Those were <laughs> such amazing anecdotes and Katie and Eli, thank you. Those were such beautiful Great. and funny and interesting writing. So thank you so much. Um, so we have two questions so far and everyone out there in the audience, if you have questions, now is the time. Uh, but we'll start with these two. The first one is from, I believe, one of your students, Eli, from Micah, who asked, Eli, any advice on finding an owl near a pond? <laughs> there most certainly is. I have yet, where we live in Western New York, I have yet to find a wooded pond without finding a resident pair of barred owls. Um, and so, like I've done to many of my classes, get out there. And I would suggest bringing a little tent if you can, staying out there and um, and obviously you can playback always works. There's, there's, you know, um, differences of opinion of whether you should use playback or not, but just, if you want, if, if any owl is enough, go to a pond and just sleep near it and listen. And you'll be amazed at, at what you'll, what you'll find. There's other more strategic ways forward, but I'll, I'll deal with that, Micah, um, <laughs> one-on-one -on -one emails. Thank you. That was a great response. I, Think there's going to be some camping out in my future. Um, <laughs> and so our next question is, how can you succeed at birding without binoculars? Well, yes, go ahead, Katie. Listening. Yeah, listening. I mean, I think that uh, listening is, I, I feel like I hear almost every bird when I go, almost every time I go birding, I hear the birds before I see them. Um, you know, and there are there are lots of birds that I only ever identify by by song. Um, my fa some of my, my favorite birds when I go birding are you know are warblers in the spring, and uh, you know once the leaves come in on those trees, you're just all you can do is listen. Yeah. Uh, so with even without binoculars, just just going out with your ears is um, is a great way to go. Great way to go birding, and you can get on. Um, there's plenty of websites you can go on and just listen to songs. And I, I feel like every spring I have to relearn some songs. Uh, oh yes, that, and you know, if you think, if you can, if you can remember the little, it helps me to remember the little phrases uh, that certain birds songs sound like, please, please, please to meet you, mm -hmm. you know, um, or other things like that. But you don't need binoc binoculars or, or uh, you could do just fine with listening. I think, I, I think that's a great answer because I, I feel like most of the time I'm birding by ear. So I'm hearing and, and that's mm -hmm. how I often can't find the bird in the tree anyway. And I had this marvelous experience on my drive out here to Texas. And I was at um, Hot Springs National Park in Arkansas. And there's this great tower at the top of the hill. And so I hiked up there and I heard a song and I thought, know that song and yet being in a different place and it being a different time of year I just it took me the longest time and suddenly I realized it's a pine warbler and it was just this it was is almost this sense of like taking me back to spring on on the east coast and where we hear the pine warblers and then I don't for months and when you say relearn it every spring I, I feel like I have to relearn it every couple months uh, but <laughs> I'm, I'm older and but you know that but hearing this song it just um I felt like I had a friend who had just showed up on this trip with me and it was this, this marvelous feeling. And I think that we often think about um, associating places with uh, smells, for instance, like a, a you know, the, the smell of a lawnmower. I think of my grandparents' basement, you know, that kind of thing. And once I started birding and I started hearing these songs, I realized that I really associate songs with places too. Like there's a certain memory trigger and, and um, a, a richness to a landscape that um, did, did, did not exist for me uh, before knowing what the birds were. I mean, I, I'd always heard them, but being able to identify them, it was finally like, oh, that's right. Your name's Eli, right? How's it going, right? You know, so it, it's, it's uh, I think even the, the richness of bird song is um, to me what's been really magical about getting to know the birds, you know, maybe even more than seeing them. Although 
I go nowhere without my binoculars, just heads up. <laughs> you know, Susan, I would add to that. People have often asked me, they're like, um, Eli, when do you go birding? You know, or, uh, or you know, let's go birding or any, any kind of thing like that. And my, my response is often, what I don't say is that I don't go birding, I am birding. Right. Like I, you know, and I think most birders get that. Like you just wake up and you're birding. Like it's yeah. because seeing them is almost incidental. There's one essay actually in this, I think it's Secret of Owls, where mm. you almost get, the, they go out by this frozen lake in the middle of winter and they sit by the side of the lake and you almost get the sense as you're reading this essay that they don't even need to see the birds. They're yeah. going to go out there with this thermos and sit next to this frozen body of water and listen you know, in the middle of the night and, and hearing it will be enough. Um, and yeah. yeah, and and I think sometimes it can be, is yeah. that it the sounds themselves are evocative enough that like right. like well, night owls especially because at night there's less noise coming from the world and so the, the way you hear them it's it just feels particularly special in the dark you know. Like, yeah. And to kind of to piggyback off that, I think that. Um, just the experience of uh, being outside with a, you have to have an excuse, right? Like you're looking for owls. Um, but really the experience of being outside listening, um, you know, being quiet with yourself or with, you know, a few other people is really wonderful. Um, and I, uh, I'm reminded um, I could hear my dog in the next room crying at me and uh, my, my, uh, she's a beagle, so she she cries all the time. But my my grandfather had uh, a lot of beagles. He used to hunt rabbits, and I put in quotation marks because really he just wandered around in the woods with his dogs, <laughs> you know, and called it hunting. But I and it, it, he would go with his brothers, um, and they would all kind of wander around quietly in the woods together. They had a great time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I I think that that experience of just sort of, you know listening, being quiet, you know, uh, being out somewhere is, uh, I think people need, need that. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. So we have, I want to make sure we get to all the questions. We have two more and I love how practical these are, um, full of great advice. So someone wants to know what slash where are the best places to look and listen for birds? <laughs> I can up the like, I am birding. <laughs> well, there, there's yeah. one, there's there's lots of ways to think about this. I, I, you know, birds like edges. So if there's a, a woods and then a field, chances are you'll find birds there. So that's the that's the one simple answer. If you want to be a total detective, you can go to a website called eBird and find locations. And so, so some places are what we call birdier than other sites, right? Where birds go there because it's good habitat. There's more bugs or there's better cover it's usually about food um and you know you can see uh in your area where people go to find birds which is often sometimes it's really beautiful places and sometimes it's not you know i i thought the birding would take me always to pretty places and i spent a lot of time near dumps or sewage treatment sewage <laughs> sewage is great <laughs> so um it's unexpected where you can find birds. Why don't you guys add to this? Well, I would. I guess I would say that um, sometimes you don't even need to go to where birds are. Um, they'll come to you if if you're patient. I I like to do a, a thing, especially in nowadays, where I, I um, for a grade, I actually have my students sit in a spot for two hours, and they they can't move from one square yard for two hours, and they just have to record everything they see. And it's something that hunters do it, you know, um, they know this innately, but if you sit in one spot, especially if it's in the spring, you'll be amazed. Uh, you know, students will come back with lists of 20 different species, not not numbers of birds, different species that came to them, you know, from one vantage point, you know, on a ridgetop or by a wetland or anything. So they're out there. It's usually just kind of putting ourselves in the practice of seeing um, that can almost be just as important. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, uh, I um, have spent a lot more time at home, probably like everybody else, you know, the last, since March. <laughs> um, I haven't been home this long ever, I don't think, in my, you know, my life probably. And I've bird my yard um, every day. Um, I have an e-bird list probably every day from my yard. And 
uh, just today I hit 101 species um, in my yard. <laughs> so it's uh, and over my yard. I had tundra swans fly over my house today. Oh um, my god! Amazing. <laughs> and it was uh, it was my it was bird 101. And uh, just to just and I have two acres. It's not a huge, you know, it's not not a huge. Wow. Um, that's incredible. Uh, but just to have that many species um, pass through, yeah. you know, my little two acres, just well, sitting Katie, and looking at it every day. I have three acres and we've been faithfully keeping a list for the last eight years at our house. And we have 97 birds, 98 if I count a rough grouse. It was a little bit, a little bit away. I'm, I'm, I'm very tempted to dig a pond just to beat your record. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a big, I have a lake. I have a lake close by. It's not, not on my property, but it's, it's just, you know, it's near. So I get a lot of the uh, fly over. Yeah. King, kingfishers and stuff like that. Yeah. Flying over. Super. Yeah. That, but that, it's great. Just what you see sitting and watching your own, your own space. You know, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. So I mentioned camping out. I think I'm going to go camp on Katie's yard. Uh, <laughs> one more question. And I think this will be our last question for the evening. And it said, um, Donna says, Given that people are traveling less and staying home more, have you noticed that there are more birds? Dot, dot, dot. Yes. <laughs> yes. We, Go ahead, Katie. And, and just from, um, from a wildlife rehab um, point of view, sort of a, uh, um, we uh, have a small, you know, small nonprofit that rehabs um, all species of native migratory birds. So everything from hummingbirds to vultures and you know everything in between uh and we hit uh we're at like 510 individual bird admissions for the year um which is a lot that's it's it's um a significant increase from last year and last year we had you know 400 and change so and we've already you know 500 and counting so that's a lot of birds to come in for rehab yeah. um this year and i think that it's people are home and noticing noticing what's happening right around them. Yeah. Uh, and there are a lot of new eBird users too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and a lot of, uh, I mean, my, my, our, our state uh, birding Facebook group has, I think hundreds more members than it did um, before this spring. Yeah. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I read is that, you know, birds, the way they communicate is through song and with all the noise that we make, sometimes they can't find each other to mate or um, feeding whatever. And uh, that there was some study already done that in fact, birds are hearing each other and finding each other more during this, you know, especially it, it fell perfectly during migration um, and then into the breeding season. So it's like, man, if we could just be quiet more often, it'd be, you know, one, one, I was, you know, I, 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 I have probably got like, text from friends and students sort of, you know, of tapes of people saying, what's this bird? And it was a song that clearly uh, they had never heard before, but because it was quieter, they could hear it, you know, and uh, that, that aspect of, this COVID time, I think, has been wonderful, and I think we can learn a lot from it. You know, so. I don't know what the question is. Are there more birds, or are there more birders? I, I <laughs> thank you, Donna. She's the one who came up with the uh, was it birdality? <laughs> I love that. Such a good turn of phrase. Yeah. Thank you all so much. This has been such an enlightening evening. I feel like I learned so much. Um, and so it's about time for us to wrap up. And so I just want to share some housekeeping stuff with our audience out there. Thank you all so much for coming. And I want to highlight that next week on next Tuesday, the 17th, we are going to be having another oblong online event <laughs> with a, it's actually going to be a poetry event um, for Alice Quinn's new collection together in a sudden strangeness with several poets responding to the pandemic. Um, so thank you all for being here. Did you have any, final remarks before we end for this evening. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm just going to um, say thank you for hosting this and thank you everybody who came. It's just, it's really fun and um, wonderful to imagine all of you both reading and looking at birds. So, and thank, yeah, I, don't, thank I don't think there's a greater joy than, than kind of talking about our shared passions. So um, 
Yeah, I thank you, Susan. Thank you, uh, everybody, for making this happen. Yeah, thank, thank you, Oblong Books. There's a, there's a little thank link you. at the bottom. Support your local bookstore. Even if you don't buy this book, you could you could buy Katie's wonderful republished uh, edition of Vulture, which is fantastic. Um, there's nothing more marvelous than vultures, and Katie does them justice. So uh, there, you could buy, you could buy you could buy Eli's book. You could buy one of Katie's books. Just buy a book from Oblong. That's all I'm going to ask you to do. <laughs> you can definitely agree with that. Yes, if anyone wants to buy signed copies of When Birds Are Near, they are available at oblongbooks.com. And we have so much love coming in from the chat. Thank you all so much again, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you all. Thank you.